thank you for everybody sharing the precious lunch break uh, with us. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Ben for being my friend and uh, good colleague for the last 15 years or so. So um, today I would like to talk to you a little bit about um, carotid artery disease and the latest guidelines which were published simultaneously from Europe and the USA only a few days ago and relate that to the NICE pathway. So as we all know, the burden of stroke in the UK is horrendous, not only in terms of death and morbidity, but also in terms of cost. So more than 50% of stroke survivors remain dependent on others. However, only up to 15% of these strokes, they follow thromboembolism from a previously asymptomatic carotid artery stenosis, which are the stenosis that we can do something about. But that's only 15%. So asymptomatic stenosis are not uncommon. As we all age, as you can see, if we scan, you can see on, on this table, we scan the general population, and for example, all men over the age of 80, we will find that almost one in 12 have got a more than 50% stenosis of their carotid artery. Now, because of this high prevalence and the cost to society in general, NICE published a pathway how to initially manage these patients, especially the ones with suspected transient ischemic attack. These are the so-called mini strokes with complete resolution of symptoms and signs within 24 hours of onset. So I will focus more on these aspects that frontline staff will come across. So NICE advocates a quick recognition of the symptoms. They don't want any fancy, difficult risk stratification systems. They just want the simple face, arm, speech test. Essentially, we look for asymmetry, either in the face or the arm, or a disturbance in the speech. And if any of these are uh, present, then the primary care physician should call an ambulance immediately if the symptoms are there at the time, or if this if the symptoms have already passed, then um, the patient should be referred to a specialist within 24 hours. So this is a slide to remind us all of the anterior and the posterior circulation of the brain. So we're looking for asymmetric motor or sensory symptoms affecting both the arm and the leg on one side of the body if we are to blame the carotid territory circulation. Whereas for the vertebral arteries, which supply the posterior circulation of the brain, they uh, produce symptoms which are commoner and arise from the brainstem and the cerebellum. So we're talking about loss of balance, loss of vision in both eyes as opposed to one, and dysarthria instead of dysphasia. So what does NICE recommend if uh, a primary care physician sees a patient like that uh, with ischemic brain symptoms essentially on the front line? Well, they recommend that all suspected transient ischemic attack patients are given aspirin and they want a hefty dose of aspirin, 300 milligrams, and then they should be referred urgently within 24 hours for specialist assessment. And, and actually NICE specifically recommends against the use of the ABCD system to assess the risk of subsequent stroke, basically just to simplify the management of these uh, patients and to speed up referral to a specialist. Now, the reason that the TIAs are really a medical emergency shown in this graph, it's a beautiful graph first published in the BMJ. And as we can see on the y-axis, we've got the cumulative risk of stroke after a, a TIA or a minor stroke. 
And this is the time, the X, X axis is the time that the event will happen. And as you can see from these graphs, both the minor stroke event or the TIA, they pose a risk to the patient in the first few days after these events. So the highest risk is certainly within the first 14 days. And the, the biggest risk is within the first three, four days, actually. So it, TIAs are really a medical emergency and NICE advocates a referral of these patients either by ambulance if the symptoms are active or if the symptoms have subsided to a specialist within 24 hours. So actually, um, NICE advocates an urgent carotid endarterectomy for patients with stable neurology and severe carotid artery stenosis. What they mean by severe is more than 50% according to the NASCED criteria. I'll show you in a moment what that means. So they also advise uh, that these patients are optimized in terms of their risk factors. So this is what NICE advocates, essentially carotid endarterectomy. This is what the operation looks like. We try and do this under local anesthesia and deep cervical regional block because that enables, enables us to have live feedback from the patient. We talk to the patient, the patient is awake and can communicate with us. So when we clump the carotid to clean it up of all the atheroma, we would know within three minutes of clamping, whether the brain is still perfused the same way, and if a shunt may be necessary. The fabric that you can see there after the repair is so that we reduce the restenosis rate. This is a backroom graft, and it's uh, fairly routine now in most of these cases. Now, NICE also advocates that people with stable neurological symptoms from a mini stroke or a TIA who have symptomatic carotid stenosis of less than 50%, they should not be operated upon and they should receive best medical treatment, which is basically optimization of the uh, risk factors. This is what we, I mentioned earlier. There are two ways, two methods of measuring percentage stenosis in a carotid. They were both named, both methods were named after the two major randomized control trials in the field, the North American and the European one. And the notation that uh, has persisted now in most research studies is the one from NASCET. They are both angiographic studies, angiographic methods that we no longer use for diagnostic purposes. So we actually have a very useful table by which we can correlate velocity criteria on a duplex ultrasound, so how fast the, the blood flows past the stenosis, and we relate that to the percentage stenosis according to the first column, which is the NASCET percentage stenosis. So about 50% NASCET stenosis produces velocities, peak velocities in the internal carotid of more than 150 centimeters per second, for example. A duplex, which is the investigation of choice advocated as the initial one uh, by NICE, is not only useful to give us percentage stenosis, more importantly, as a specialist, I find that um, I can gauge uh, the quality of the plaque. So as you can see, the two white lines here, uh, is, are the walls of the vessel. Sorry, there's a lot of sun coming in. I'm just reducing the sun. Now, um, you can see the carotid is a cylinder and there's a, a bump here and that's the carotid plaque causing stenosis. As you can see, it's very calcified. This is a very stable plaque and very unlikely to embolize and be the, 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 the cause of a stroke. This is another type of plaque. It's on the upper surface now. And as you can see, it's a bit of a mixed plaque. It's mostly calcified, but it has a core, which is more a collusion, it's black. 
So this is a soft plaque and it can crack and produce emboli to the brain. But again, a type three plaque, because it's mostly calcified, is considered a stable one. And this is as opposed to a plaque type two, which as you can see, it's mostly a collusion, mostly black and soft, and it's only covered by a thin layer of membrane, which is calcified, which can easily crack and hence embolize. But the most difficult one, the most dangerous one is plaque type one. This is the carotid bifurcation, external carotid up here, internal carotid there with a common carotid around this area. And when you first look at it, you may not notice that there is actually a plaque here. You can vaguely see a membrane there and nothing here. But if you put color flow on it, you can see that there is actually a stenosis with a very soft plaque. And these are the most dangerous plaques that can cause thromboembolism. These are the plaques along with the type two that cause the 15% of strokes from all the asymptomatic severe carotid stenosis. This is what a plaque causing a TIA or a stroke looks like in the operation. Uh, as you can see, the internal surface of the carotid is no longer smooth and there are black bits in places. These are actually platelet thrombi which is why NICE recommends that we give aspirin as soon as you see the patient to, uh, as first line treatment. Of course, somebody having a TIA is highly unlikely they're having a hemorrhagic stroke because hemorrhagic strokes cause major, major di disability. So TIAs, which mostly uh, resolve within 24 hours of the symptoms, are highly likely that they are ischemic in nature from platelet thrombi, so do give aspirin to your patients unless you know of a, of a convincing contraindication. The major controversies amongst the specialists in carotid surgery are three at the moment. So the first one is whether an intervention is better than best medical therapy. The second one is whether we manage asymptomatic stenosis the same way as symptomatic. And finally, whether open surgery is better than using a stent. As you know, in heart surgery, stents have um, uh, replaced open surgery in much of their workload. But that is not the case for carotids, as I will show you in a moment. So the latest update um, was published a few days ago from Europe. This was uh, an update from about eight years ago. And then very recently, the very influential Society for Vascular Surgery from the USA has published their update, uh, which was 10 years in the making. It was published a few days ago. They knew I would be giving this lecture to you, so they helped my, uh, they made my life easier. So what are the main recommendations? Okay, so for asymptomatic patients who can tolerate surgery comfortably and are found to have a severe stenosis more than 70% on NASCAD criteria, they recommend open surgery, endarterectomy over and above best medical treatment. So for the first time, they've collected data over several years and they're coming out with a very clear message. Another recommendation is whether uh, carotid endarterectomy is better than stenting. And again, they have come out with a clear statement that endarterectomy is preferred over stenting in general, uh, especially for the patients that are of lower periprocedural risk, especially for the over 70, for acute TIAs or minor strokes. And we also have to remember that uh, stenting is more dangerous. It causes more periprocedural events. So it causes more strokes than open surgery. And it also causes more restenosis. So because it's a foreign body inside, the um, 
our, our bodies uh, respond to the stenting and they form an internal scar called, called hyperintimal hyperplasia, which actually causes wrist stenosis, and the wrist stenosis rate is much higher in stents than in open surgery. So I am going through the last three or four slides, not to bore you, and I'll leave more time for questions. So another recommendation is with regards to the optimal timing for a carotid intervention. If you remember, NICE um, has recommended that uh, especially seize these patients with TIAs within 24 hours, and that's because the latest recommendation is that we operate on these patients if they fulfill certain criteria between 48 hours and within 14 days of the onset of symptoms. And that's because we're trying to save all that um, upstroke in the graph I showed you initially, uh, that the highest risk is within these 14, first 14 days after the symptoms. So a final recommendation uh, is that patients that have had a major stroke with major disability and a ranking score over three, that means that they uh, are unable to walk and attend to uh, activities of daily living without assistance. These patients, they need to be stabilized and uh, have best medical treatment rather than have uh, surgery. Finally, something which is useful for primary care Physicians is whether screening for carotid stenosis is recommended for the general population. Well, for the general population, it is not recommended. But if somebody has got uh, atherosclerotic disease in other vascular beds, such as coronary heart disease or peripheral arterial disease, then they are considered at high risk of carotid stenosis, and hence the recommendation is that these people are referred for screening of their carotids. So this is my last slide. Essentially, um, carotid artery disease is a very specialized field, changing dynamically with the ongoing RCTs that are going on at the moment. Only a very small percentage of asymptom asymptomatic carotid artery stenosis patients may need an operation. And uh, it's for the specialist to work out which of these patients will benefit from such an operation, and the vast majority will not need one. So 85% do not need an operation if they are asymptomatic. If they are symptomatic, yes, they do need an operation if they have a, a high stenosis. And of course, symptomatic carotid disease must be seen within 24 hours by a specialist. Thank you very much for your attention.